On today's podcast on Time Matters in a Trauma Setting. The question we have is what happens when the spleen is shattered and bleeding out? You've embolized the artery, you've lost the spleen and it's just sitting there. And that's where the controversy comes in. From an IR perspective, we can embolize anything you ask us to do, but is that the right thing for the patient? And that's where a team joint effort makes a difference. And having trauma surgeons who are good operators and interventionists who are confident in challenging cases. Hello, my name is Andrew Sorensen with Boston Scientific, and I have the privilege to be joined with Dr. Alika Kashef, who is the Head of Interventional Radiology and Directorate Safety Lead at Imperial College NHS Trust in London. Additionally, she has been the lead for trauma radiology there since 2011, and she also serves on the Circe's Standard Committee and is a part of the Scientific Program Committee for BSIR and ET. And today we are talking about how time matters in trauma settings. Before we dive into our topic, Dr. Kashef, uh, could you please share a little bit about your background in practice? Well, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, I think you've, you've covered my roles quite well. I'm an attending or consultant interventional radiologist in London. Um, and my practice is sort of covers trauma imaging, trauma intervention, and uh, vascular interventions in women's health. Uh, but I've got a particular interest in trauma, which is why I'm here today. Awesome. Um, so out of curiosity, could you just share some of the things about treating in a trauma setting that motivate you and maybe some of the things that you find particularly challenging as well? Um, I think the uh, best part about trauma imaging is that there's an algorithm from a, a minute the patient before even they come into the hospital. So you've got a teamwork, everyone knows their role, you've got a trauma team leader. So we have a formula to do and that's quite good because I like a regime and I know what to follow. Um, but I think the challenge of that, with that comes the not knowing what patient's coming in with. So they come in with a picture that looks very simple, fall from height, and then you scan them and you find all sorts and there's no history. So there's a lot of detective work. So if you don't have a good team, that can be quite challenging. So working together with your non-IR and non-radiology colleagues is very key in making sure patients have good outcomes. Hmm. Fascinating. Well, emergency and trauma procedures are a pretty diverse topic, so I thought we would hone in on two very common traumas, hepatic trauma and splenic trauma. So let's start with the most straightforward, hepatic trauma. What is your al algorithm when a patient presents with something believed to potentially be hepatic trauma? Well, most patients, obviously, um, when they come in, they're sort of either found or hit by a car. So they come in with major trauma or major hemorrhage where there's a significant amount of blood um, lost somewhere. And so the first thing we do is the, obviously the airway breathing circulation access um, with the team. I tend to show up to the trauma cause myself because I like to be there if there's a major hemorrhage so that I know what's going on. And it allows you to understand what the patient's response is to fluid resuscitation. After that, Sometimes a patient has a bedside ultrasound called the fast scan, where they actually look at the free fluid in the belly. If the patient's got blood and they're unstable, they go to theatre for exploration. But if they're responding to fluid with blood, they go for a CT. And we've got special um, imaging techniques that we do, which we've actually published on at our centre, which we picked up from Camp Bastion, which is called the combi scan. Um, or if they're very sick, we split the dose into an arterial and port of venous, and then we identify all the organs, is it bleeding and it's not? And we have a very good checklist and then we identify the liver bleed and that's where the discussion starts or whether the patient gets embolized or not. Um, and, and that's where talking to our general surgeons, our trauma team leader and the IR consultant or attending is key. So once you've identified, okay, this is a patient that we're going to embolize, mm -hmm. um, how do you proceed from there? So if the patient's bleeding from an um, artery, we embolize it. If it's from a vein, we don't have a role in it that much. And the reason for that is because the veins are huge and generally they tear. It's not just a simple transection. So if the patient's bleeding from a vein, they go to theater and they get packed. But if it's an artery, we get involved. And the way I like to say it to my students is when you have a bone fracture and the bone is fixed, um, if it's really bad, there's something called an X-fix where you put metal work outside the bone to keep it together. And then you have to actually put a nail inside the bone eventually to fix the bone. And that's how we work together with the liver. The surgeons go in and pack the liver from the outside for the venous bleed, but we go from the inside to stop the arterial bleed. So we're the, like the intermodullary nail to their X-fix. It kind of works really well together. Um, and how we would do that is essentially an arterial approach where pretty much everything we do is from the groin. More recently, radial artery approach has been a common thing because access is so much easier for the celiac. So, um, and, 
consent wise we have to consent the patient if they're unconscious we have to do a special consent for them and if they're awake we do it before they get intubated they go into the IR suite or the hybrid suite um, once we're in there it's going to be the standard who checklist making sure we've got everything we need and do the puncture in the artery get into the vessel and do an angiogram and if there's a bleed then we choose how to embolize it got it so as far as device selection what considerations do you have when embolizing a hepatic trailer so with the hepatic, um, if there is a stabbing where we know, or penetrating injury, where we know the capsule has been breached and there's active bleeding, we know that bleeding is not going to be stopped by the capsule. So you've lost the natural body's tamponade effect and the capsule's got a hole in it that's going to bleed out. So in those scenarios with active bleeding and no capsule, we tend to actually use a combination. So something like um, gel foam, which is a temporary thing, acts as a plug, sort of closes the hole in the dam, and then you put your uh, more definitive, such as quills in. Now, with trauma, we don't know if the patients are anticoagulated, unwell, liver disease, etc. So I think fibroid quills are better to use in these scenarios because it actually promotes thrombosis. But also, your anesthesiologist is your best friend in this scenario because they're going to give products that are going to help the hemostasis, tranexamic acid, and all that kind of formula that they know how to do. So it's kind of a, a two-way system, really, rather than us just doing it on our own. We can only mechanically block it. Um, if the patient's got a transected artery, uh, we try to find the front door and the back door. So we put coils on either side of the bleeding so the, the damaged area of the liver doesn't bleed out. And very, very rarely um, we use particles if there's diffuse bleeding. Um, and if we have to, and there's no other ways of stopping the bleeding, we actually embolize the main hepatic artery, which I've never had to physically do. I've done segments, but not the whole artery. Hmm. Interesting. Well, that's fascinating. Let's dive in to splenic trauma. I know there's been some fascinating publications recently in this area. So first off, what's your methodology for splenic trauma? And you know, what's some of the recent clinical literature that you find interesting in this space? So splenic is interesting because it's a very simple organ. It's got one blood supply, arterial, one drainage venous. Um, and it's a single organ sitting in the corner, kind of getting along. And it's the commonest, one of the commonest injured. is spleen, kidney, and liver are the commonest injured solid organs. And um, the challenge is very controversial because if you sit, depending on the center you're at, the management is very different. And the reason for that is because the grading of splenic um, trauma has been a bit of a point of controversy. It's recently been reviewed by the American um, uh, sort of trauma societies and they've kind of have come up with surgical grading, but the radiological grading doesn't match the clinical scenario. So um, the publications have looked at anything from grade one to grade five and how embolization works. So we know embolizing works. The question we have is what happens when the spleen is shattered and bleeding out? You've embolized the artery, you've lost the spleen and it's just sitting there. And that's where the controversy comes in. From an IR perspective, we can embolize anything you ask us to do, but is that the right thing for the patient? And that's where a team joint effort makes a difference. And having trauma surgeons who are good operators and interventionists who are confident in challenging cases. Um, the basics are, if you see a blush, a bleed or a pseudoaneurysm on the splenic, you embolize it. You don't leave a blush. Some people say if there is a blush, you could potentially leave it after a, a bit of product giving and tranexamic acid and you can medically thrombose it. And some of them do thrombose in the first 48 hours, but we don't know which ones. And, that, and I don't know anyone who's comfortable leaving a trauma patient who's got a known pseudoaneurysm. So we tend to treat those. If, however, you've got a splenic injury with no pseudoaneurysm, there is very little data that embolizing is going to make a difference. So that's kind of the overarching kind of decision making. You see a blush, you treat it. We also tend to do follow-up imaging on our spleens and do a scanning at about 72 hours because sometimes we find the whatever has happened to the remodeling of the vessel damage can cause a fistula formation. And if that happens in the future, in the, uh, the follow-up, then we can actually embolize that too. But we don't know which injury progresses to a fistula which doesn't. All we know is that majority of splenic traumas do not present with fistulas. They present with pseudos or some sort of a bleed. Interesting. So I know there's also been uh, a decent amount of discussion on proximal versus distal embolization yeah. as well. Could you talk a little bit on kind of how you manage some of the trade-offs between those two Yeah, options? so just to sort of uh, go through what those means, because not everyone sort of um, knows the practice. A distal embolization is when you go into the end artery in the spleen that's bleeding and you embolize it, so it's targeted. Um, the, and the benefits of that is it's, um, it stops the point of bleeding and it preserves the spleen 
um, apart from the bit you've embolized. But the downside is that it's challenging to get to because the spleen is very tortuous and it's an end artery. So if you embolize it, there's a risk of infarction, necrosis and eventual infection. So now we've moved on towards a more proximal, which is where the main splenic artery is embolized distal to the dorsal pancreatic artery. So you, because if you embolize the, at the level of the pancreatic artery, you can get pancreatitis as a complication, which we always can send patients for. And the idea of that is non-targeted embolization and to reduce the perfusion pressure to the spleen. In, and that allows the bleeding to stop but the splenic function to remain. Now, no one knows truly how to measure splenic function. But what we do consider splenic function is if the spleen enhances on the follow-up imaging. As opposed to these young patients who are going to go to theatre, have the spleen taken out and lose all their splenic function. This is giving them a chance. And I always say to my trauma surgeons that if this doesn't work, we haven't burnt any bridges. They can still do this splenectomy if they clinically feel they need it. But this is a good way of reducing the bleeding and complications for a patient while they keep their spleen. Um, so we tend to go for proximal unless the patient is actively bleeding and is behaving um, in an unstable manner. We would go targeted um, or we would go for gel foam and then coils. But if there's just a couple of pseudoaneurysms, we would tend to go for main artery embolization now. And that's where the practice has shifted to. And the risk of infection is much lower. Interesting. So what are some of your go-to tools for both proximal as well as those distal applications? Yeah. So for... Um, Proximal, the best part is that it's quick. You get in, you get out. Um, it's easier to uh, navigate through the splenic artery because you're not going as distally as you would with the distal embolization. Um, and I find generally I, I like to use detachable coils because I like the control, especially with trauma. And if the patient's not asleep and they move around, the spleen is very tortuous, so it's difficult to sometimes push things through. Um, so I like to have that control, but obviously with that comes the downside that if it's very tortuous, you can detach the coil on the delivery. Distal, you tend to use a microcatheter because remember, these patients are not vascular paths. They've got normal arteries. If you put something big in there, it's going to spasm. So a microcatheter um, is much better to use for distal. And I tend to use just pushable coils for those areas because it's an end artery, so I'm not really worried about what's going to happen to it. It's not going to go anywhere. Whereas the main embolization for the artery would be more detachable coils. Got it. And what are some of the things that you look for in a coil for those proximal applications? Um, so, um, again, going back to normal bleeds versus trauma bleeds, the vessels are normal. So oversizing should be just enough to keep the, the, the coil in place. You don't have to massively oversize like you do with an aneurysm. You don't have anything to pack. So what you want is a predictable coil. So something that's a bit flexible, but still stiff enough to be pushable. You don't want anything too floppy. I don't anyway. Some of my colleagues do. Um, and as I said, I think fibroid is better than non-fibroid simply because it thromboses quicker. Um, and then the detachable quality is good because you can adjust it, especially if the spleen is spasming, the splenic artery, sorry, spasming, and you can just pull and push a little bit. And you can create yourself a nice nest as well with it if you go for a bigger coil and then build it up with smaller coils if you need to. Some people use plugs. Um, again, the downside of plugs is that you have to put a, a delivery sheath or catheter into the actual um, sp uh, spleen. And if they're going to spasm, you're in a very challenging position. And I don't like to mess around with the artery. When I get in the artery, I like to do an angio do the coiling and get out. So I find the, the least you manipulate, the better it is. So changing and putting a sheath in and a guiding cath, I don't tend to do that, but they're absolutely doable options. It definitely seems like when, when time is of the essence, simplicity absolutely. matters. Exactly. Um, it, it, and these also tend to be pretty high flow situations Correct. as well. Um, so any tick, tips or tricks for, for making sure that you, you know, have uh, your, your coil not migrate? Yeah, I think the, the biggest challenge will be the oversizing. And I mean, with Boston as an example, you actually have a nice guiding, uh, a little guide sheet of sizes that you can use. But planning your CT is the key, really. You'd measure, because each patient's going to be different. The other thing is these patients are going to be underfilled. So there's going to be some volume loss and the vessel will be a bit vasoconstricted. So what you want is an anesthetist who's filling in the patient with resuscitation. So when they come to you in the, on the table, you're going to get a vessel that's its maximum size, potentially. Um, you measure it on the, um, on the CT scan, correct the diameter, and you would up it by one or two millimeters at most, no more than that. Um, and that's pretty much what you want. The other one is a, a cooperative patient, is an easy patient. So you want to make sure that the patient's going to tolerate things. Get your team to give the analgesia before you start, and that way your deployment will be more accurate because the minute you start deploying, they're going to get ischemic pain from their spleen.
Um, and the way I always look at this is, and we talked about this just now, in surgery and trauma, they do damage control surgery where you stop the bleeding and then you go for definitive management. Spinal artery embolization is exactly the same. It's damage control IR, as I call it, where you're going to go there, stop the bleeding and get out. And you want to use the device that's going to be predictable again and again and again, which is where detachable cores come into it. Awesome. So you've mentioned interlock a few times as kind of one of your go-to solutions. Oh, I said detachable. You said detachable. <laughs> yeah. You are correct. Interlock is one of them, yes. <laughs> uh, so what are what are some of the uh, devices that you, you tend to prefer? Yeah, um, interlock is actually one of the ones I do use. I was just uh, teasing you there. Um, yes, I think for, for 018, to be honest, it's what's on the shelf. I think when it comes to pushable 018 catheters, a uh, coil, sorry, um, we do, we, we use what's available. Um, and also we just need a variety of sizes available depending on side. So I'm not going to say I want an interlock because I want an interlock. It's more to do with, I need a three millimeter by three. What do you have? Um, and then, you know, especially with times are being tough right now with delivery of stock, we are a little bit more limited, unfortunately. Um, I don't tend to use, I, and when it comes to 035s and high flow systems, I prefer the interlock. Um, and w for example, another area that I use interlock a lot on is my ovarian veins. And it's because of the fact that I want to know it's going to stay. And actually one of my colleagues um, last weekend had a case that we discussed, not a trauma, but it was a, sp a spontaneous splenic rupture. And, um, and they ended up using an interlock because of that very reason, because they needed to see whether it was going to stay in place. Um, and of course, there was a bit of movement and they managed to adjust the interlock before deploying it to ensure that it stayed in place. So that's the best part. You can do a mock embolization and see whether it works. And in high flow or big vessels, not so much high flow, big vessels, I prefer detachable because it gives me that reassurance. And I do the same with my internal iliac aneurysms where I know this coil is going to predictably deploy in a certain way and behave once it's out there. So that's the reason I like to choose interlock. Awesome. So with the detachable coils that you've mentioned, you've also mentioned fibers yes. quite a few times. Could you just talk about why fibers for your practice and, and what they do for yeah. you? So I think with, um, as I said, with the, with the 018 stuff, it's more to do with what's on the shelf. But where it comes to bigger vessels, um, size uh, measurements are important, but the fibers are important because in trauma, we don't know if the patient's got underlying coagulopathy, undercoagulation, et cetera, et cetera. So we need everything we can take for helping thrombosis of vessels as soon as possible. So that comes with the anesthetist giving the products and for us using fibroid. Um, and essentially what I like about fibroid is it doesn't rely on packing density. So I think that I don't like a coil to just be shoving it in until we physically block the space. What we want is something that's going to promote the embolization as well as equipping the space. And fibroids do that very quickly. Um, and if you leave one, and I've done this with my venous systems, if you're just moving around and taking a bit of time, the minute you take the coil out, there's already clot on it. And that's what you want in your embolization. Um, you want fast thrombosis, predictable time and response time, and then you get out. Whereas when you put coils that are bland, you're not going to know how long before it embolizes or thrombosis because so much of it is dependent on the patient's blood products. Whereas I think this sort of adds that little extra little something that reassures you that you're just walking away, not having to come back. Awesome. So there was a study put out by some physicians uh, a handful of years ago from Johns Hopkins uh, that looked at the top four yeah. 018 detachable coils yeah. uh, and wanted to look at how their different mm. uh, characteristics affected occlusion efficiency in terms of time to stasis yeah. as well as number of coils to achieve stasis. Mm. Uh, and what they found was interlock coils uh, occluded the fastest and required the fewest amount of coils. Yeah. Um, just curious if that's something that you've seen in your practice mm -hmm. as well and, and what that maybe has meant to you in, in your institution. You know, definitely. Um, I've kind of tried most coils out there, um, not extensively, but I've done enough cases to decide whether I can, if I like it or not. And I think what I like about the interlock is the fact that you've got the longer coils and you've got the larger coils, so therefore it's easy to just put something in, whether you want to pack it or do it sort of stra um, you know, uh, stretched out, you can. But um, I tend to use less coils because it's just, it does the job and you get out. And there are other coils um, from that study that require, a l there are larger co coils, but they also require a lot more coil packaging because it's all about making it dense and creating a nest to literally create a barrier for the embolization, which as I said, it's not ideal for a trauma case. You just want to put 
something one or two coils and then you get out I mean you know I've, I've done aneurysms where I've used 50 coils and it's tiring and you don't want to do that so I think um, I think having something that predicts the thrombosis fewer coils quicker and interlock kind of fits a lot of those bills obviously I don't always use interlock for every case that I do but it's something that I prefer but if it's if, if all we have is a 30 centimeter pushable then that's all I have and I use it because we're going to be in a stable position. But it's just not to have that reassurance in the middle of the night that you're going to use a product that's going to predictably do what you want it to do and interlock feeds into that quite nicely. Awesome. Well, Dr. Kashef, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you and greatly appreciate your willingness and your time uh, to share your expertise. Uh, any last words that you have for the audience? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, um, intervention's great, but I think it's... Um, uh, it's on, only as great as its team. So I think the thing about trauma and good outcomes is always working with the team and getting involved clinically. So if you're involved in trauma interventions, get involved with your trauma team, show up to the cases and learn about the patient care so that, that will be, uh, you'll be a valuable contribution to the, de to the department and the team rather than just doing the, uh, you know, the procedures. Well, that's great. Just wanted to thank our audience to listening to Time Matters and a Trauma Sending podcast brought to you by Boston Scientific. When we challenge, we advance.